now for something different. We have five short talks, each 12 minutes, with approximately three minutes of question time. And these are talks by abstract award winners. Um, and as you probably know, we rated all abstracts um, blindly. Uh, well, not, you know, you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> and they, there's a lot of, there's a lot of blind, blind talks, but, uh, and uh, so, so these were the, the, the five best abstracts, uh, according to us. Um, and they will give uh, a short presentation. And the first one is Sami Abut. Hello, everyone. My name is Sami. I'm a PhD student in the ICM in Paris. I'm doing my PhD under the supervision of uh, Laurent Cohen. Uh, but I, what I'll be presenting to you today is uh, my, uh, the work I did in my master's th thesis in Jerusalem. Uh, I was working with uh, Amira Mehdi. And the name of the work is the number form area and the blind. Uh, I will start with uh, a short background, uh, then I'll tell you what was our uh, methodology. Uh, I'll present to you our results and finish with the conclusions. So uh, we all have a visual cortex. I'm specifically interested in the ventral, ventral stream in the visual cortex. And as we know, we, in the ventral stream, we have preference for many uh, visual categories. For example, faces, places, words. Um, uh, so. And, and recently, there has been a new uh, category that was introduced uh, to, the, to the ventral stream. And this is uh, an area with preference for visual numerals. It has been shown by uh, using, uh, using ECOG. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a sensitive, it's a preference for visual numbers in the right inferior uh, temporal gyrus. Uh, now, the existence of this area has been previously predicted by Cohen and Dean. And then uh, Miyotso and Karamatsu uh, provided uh, more, uh, more evidence for if it exists, it's probably going to be in the, in the right uh, hemisphere. And uh, the theory is that it's been hidden from, from us because the area there suffers from, uh, from bold signal uh, dropout due to the magnetic susceptibility act artifacts. Uh, so if we'd like to, to just uh, summarize the ventral stream, just to describe the ventral stream in one line, it, we would like to say that it has uh, various preferences to specialized visual sub-processes. But if we do take a look at, uh, at a different angle, uh, with, we take a look at the ventral stream with a different angle, we actually see that act it is also activated for uh, non-visual uh, input, for example, and just one example. The lateral occipital complex has been shown uh, to be sensitive to tactile shape recognition for this form discrimination. And it is also activated in, in the blind. So for the same example of the LOC, it's also activated in the blind for the same tasks. And in addition, you, we can see uh, that the visual word form uh, uh, area is also activated in the blind for, for uh, braille uh, reading. And this is in no way specific to the ventral stream. So we have uh, the same thing. We, we can see it also in the dorsal stream. For MT, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have sensitivity to auditory, uh, to auditory and tactile motion, uh, the middle occipital gyri as well for auditory, auditory localization. And this is also activated in the sighted and the, in the blind. So the main question of my, uh, of my, uh, of my work was, what is, the nature of, what is the nature of the computation that is executed in this newly found area for visual numerals? And in order to test that, we were using uh, congenital blindness as a model to the organization of the ventral cortex that had never seen, any, uh, had, had never seen light. Uh, in order to deliver our stimuli, we used a technique called sensory substitution, which is a technique to convey shape information using auditory stimuli. So just for uh, with a short, uh, just a short explanation, what is uh, sensory substitution? Uh, so the idea is that we take an image and we transform it from the space uh, from the x y space to the to the space of frequency and time. So each line each line in the image is mapped into a frequency, a musical note in this case, and then we we would scan uh, we would scan the image column by column from left to right, and at a certain moment we would play all the all the pixels that are active in this uh, in the, in this column. Uh, specifically, this, uh, this uh, sensory substitution algorithm that we used encodes also color information using timber. So if, if the, these pixels sound with a, played with a violin, it would be yellow. And if it's, uh, it sounds like a trumpet, it would be blue. Uh, so our procedure was that we recruited eight congenitally blind subjects. Each of them had between 20, uh, 25 to 30 hours of training on this uh, SSD algorithm. And afterwards, we did a resting state. Uh, we, we did an MRI session with a resting state acquisition and two two runs of a slow event-related experiment. And uh, in our experiment, we used three symbols: the symbols I, V, and X in three colors. So it makes a total of nine auditory stimuli. And then subjects had to perform three sta three tasks while listening to these stimuli. And the tasks were 
uh, what is the number this shape represents? What is the color the, that uh, that this sh what, what is the color of this shape? And what is the letter that this uh, this shape uh, represents? And uh, the idea was that we we were using exactly the same physical stimulation under all tasks. This means that if we see any difference between these tasks, it is because of how we interpret the the, the symbols and not what goes into the system. Um, so I will just give you a small uh, small demonstration of how it sounds like. So here we can see that the V is going down and then going up. So uh, what the subjects heard wa was an auditory instruction telling them what's the task that they're going to um, be doing. And then afterwards, three repetitions of the same of the stimuli that you just heard. And then they had to press a button according to the task. So if the task was a numeral task and it was a V, they had to press five. Whereas if, if it was a color task, they had to press according to the color. Uh, so uh, what we did was a GLM uh, random effects uh, group analysis. And, we, uh, and what we see is that when we contrast the numeral task with all the other tasks, we see that the same area in the right inferior temporal cortex is activated. Uh, and, and this is a reproduction of, of what has been shown uh, using ECOG in, in the blind. Um, so if we, if we refer back to our main question, we, we can say that the computation now that's performed in the visual number form area is not strictly visual in nature. Uh, now, if we compare the letter task into all, with, with all the other tasks, we didn't, we didn't get, get any significant clusters in the random effects analysis. So we're just interested to, to see what is happening there. We ran a fixed effects analysis, and we, we found that there is a trend in the visual cortex. In, uh, the, only, uh, the only place that we found any significant result in the visual cortex was the visual word form area, where we saw a trend for, uh, for these tasks. Now, it's a little bit surprising, before, because many, many, um, um, many experiments have already shown that the visual word form area is activated in the blind for, blind read, uh, for braille reading and even uh, using uh, SSD reading. Uh, and why didn't we get this in this experiment? Uh, there are a few possible reasons. One of them is that we didn't really do dedicated uh, training for reading. So our, uh, our subjects might not have been specialized in reading in comparison to other tasks, uh, to other uh, studies. And another option is that the nature of our, our task implicitly activated the, 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 the visual word form area under all tasks. So this, it is possible that the subject couldn't have refrained from uh, matching the, the symbol with, with a letter uh, representation. So, uh, so if, we, if we're trying to say that the, the, the computations there in, in, this, in these two areas, the visual word form area and the visual number form area, is not visual in nature, then what, what would it be? And our proposal is that regardless of the sensory modality used for, for the symbol input, what's happening in the visual number form area is that this area is deciphering shapes of numerals for the purpose of accessing the quantity they represent. And then if we look at the visual word form area, we would say that it deciphers shapes of letters for the purpose of accessing the phonemes that they represent. And this is, uh, this is what we think these areas are doing. Uh, now, if, if we do a small recap of what we know until now, we, we have seen a dissociation between letter processing areas and numeral processing areas in the ventral stream of the visual cortex. One of them is right lateralized, the other one is left lateralized. Uh, and we've seen that this dissociation is also preserved in the blind. So the question is, so this is, this is also this is very interesting because letters and numerals are, are a new culture, uh, cultural uh, invention and they are learned in childhood. They are similar in features. Some languages even use the same symbol for letters and for numbers. And they're only distinguished by cultural convention. So it's just the, 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 the meaning that they carry is what differentiates them. Um, therefore, it is, it is very interesting to see them be, being dissociated in the cortex. Uh, so we speculated that uh, uh, when thinking what, what could lead to this, uh, what could cause this uh, distinct visual processing areas. So our speculation is that maybe the functional circuit that each area is connected with, uh, connected with is influencing this kind of uh, specialization. And then we would predict that the visual number form area would preferentially connect to, quantity, to a quantity process processing network, whereas the visual word form area would preferentially connect to a language processing network. And to test, this, uh, to, test this, uh, to test these predictions, we ran a functional connectivity analysis on our resting state da data. And uh, we defined two seeds, a numeral seed defined in the right inferior te temporal gyros in the cl cluster we just found, and the letter seed that is in the, in the visual uh, word form area. And then when we run the analysis on our group of blind people, what we see is that uh, uh, the, the connectivity pattern from the seed in the, in the visual uh, number form area is actually connected with the right IPS, which is a known, 
uh, which is known to hold the quantity representation, whereas the visual word form seed is actually connected to prefrontal and temporal language areas. Now, we asked ourselves if this is a pattern that is only, the, it is only related to our group of blind people, so we ran the same analysis on a matched group of, uh, of sighted controls, and we actually see the same, the same thing. The, the visual number form area is actually now connected to bilateral uh, IPS, whereas the letter seed is also connected to prefrontal and uh, temporal uh, language areas. Now, we did a comparison, a statistical comparison between the, the two uh, connectivity patterns, and we actually show that uh, the, the connectivity, the stronger connectivity b between the, the visual number form area and the right IPS is actually more, it, it is statistically, uh, it is statistically, statistically stronger than the connectivity of the la uh, letter C to this area. And the same thing we, sh we see, the, the symmetrical thing we see for the letter C and uh, the temporal uh, uh, the temporal uh, language areas, and this is, uh, this is very similar between the, uh, the blind and the sighted. Uh, so if I'd like to summarize, I would say that the visual uh, word form area and the visual number form area are reproducibly activated in the blind and in the sighted, uh, and they're uh, respectively connected to language and quantity areas. So if we take these two, uh, two points together, we would, like, we would like to propose that the distinct specificity of numerals and letters emerges independently of sensory modality and visual experience, possibly under the influence of connectivity patterns. Uh, and I'd like to finish with this ending. And like, I would like to propose that maybe it is time to actually remove the word visual from our naming conventions of these areas. Thank you for your attention. We have time for one or two questions. Yes. I, I did see variability. Some subjects actually activated in the single subjects, and the others don't. I, we have, I haven't tried to correlate it to anything. Thanks. Just a very quick question. Maybe I, mi I missed it. Um, you said that the reason why this region has been missed for 20 years is because of the susceptibility artifacts. Or yeah. So, so I didn't get how, how exactly did you deal with that? So, uh, actually, a priori, we didn't d directly deal with that, but it is, uh, this, um, this artifact is modulated by, for example, the angle of scanning in the head. Uh, it's, mo it's, it's different uh, according to your protocol. So, specifically, our protocol was a little bit more sensitive in this area. This is one. Two, I think that uh, our coordinates are a little bit more anterior than the classical area, and this could have been, uh, this could have been put our area in a place which is less susceptible to this uh, artifact. And also, we, had a, we developed a small, uh, a very simple uh, filtering, te filtering technique where we actually draw a histogram of the intensity values of the bold, and we, we change for each, sub for each subject, we, s we set a threshold between noise and data uh, which gives us a more, uh, let's say, lenient uh, thresholding. If you compare it, for example, to the threshold of SPM, which, is, which says anything below the 80% 80, 80 of the medial, uh, median is, uh, is dead. Thanks. Thanks. The next speaker is Florence Buhali. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Florence. Thank you. <laughs> I'm uh, exactly from the same lab as Sami, also working under the supervision of Florent Cohen. And um, the study I'm going to um, tell you about is entitled The Anatomical Connections of the Visual World from Area. Now, if you've been paying attention to Marlene Berman's, Berman's talk yesterday, you should already see where I'm going with this. But, um, um, so let's, 
go for it again. So um, in the one trial stream, we have these many domain-specific areas that respond to uh, given uh, categories, that respond preferentially to given categories of visual objects. And now you're uh, quite familiar already with the visual word for Maria, the VWFA, which is last lateralized and which is especially sensitive to uh, words. So uh, this area is thought to recognize letters and their combination into words in a hierarchical manner from more posterior regions to its more anterior regions. And once the orthography has been decoded, this information can be sent uh, to a widespread left, lateral, left lateralized reading network for access to phonology and meaning. This area is localized in the left occipital temporal sulcus, the OTS, and it has a quite reproducible location, both across individuals but also across scripts and cultures. So when you're Chinese or English, as long as you're familiar with the script, you will activate your visual word for Maria. Now, this is surprising because reading and writing are really recent on the evolution scale. So uh, one can only develop specialization for reading once they have received literacy instruction. Um, and this area cannot be uh, a priori dedicated to word recognition. So this reproducibility suggests that somehow the last OTS is optimal for reading. There are two main explanations that can, sorry, <laughs> that can be put forward for this. Um, the first one is that left OTS is optimal for reading because visual biases, biases make it suitable for written word recognition. And a second hypothesis uh, would be that um, it's optimal for reading because it is optimally connected to language areas, which then allows for building an efficient reading network. Or it could as well be a combination of these two reasons. Right? Um, so there are strong, uh, strong evidence for both, uh, for, for both hypotheses. Um, in support of uh, the importance of visual biases, there's the fact that we know this, um, this area, this left OTS, has a preference for small fellow stimuli. And we also know that this area is especially sensitive to line junctions. Also, if you teach monkeys, if you teach macaques to recognize different sets of objects, uh, of symbols, uh, and notably alphanumeric symbols, they will, uh, they will reproducibly build um, the same areas so across the macaques. You will see a certain reproducibility. Uh, but still, for the monkeys, those uh, symbols do not have any more meaning than how many drops of water they're going to get if they choose this symbol over another one. But there are also very strong evidence for the second hypothesis of the importance of connectivity in shaping the visual word for Maria. Uh, the main one that has already been mentioned is that the VWFA is collateralized with language areas. So most of the time you will find it in the left hemisphere but uh, in people who have a right hemispheric dominance for language, you can find it in the right hemisphere. And also, um, and this goes back to Sami Stolk and Ella's work, um, this, this area is not quite visual, so it cannot only be explained by visual biases. Indeed, when the, congen the congenitally blind read dry, they activate their visual word from area, also through auditory substitution, and also in the congenitality deaf, you can see that this area is activated in sign language when people use finger spelling. So it's rather an orthographic area than a letter area. Or, okay, letter or orthography, but sh surely not only visual. So that's why uh, we were mainly uh, interested in this, second, uh, in this second hypothesis of the importance of the anatomical connectivity of the visual word for Maria. Still, the connections of this area are not, were not so, ha haven't been really studied, and that's why we focused on this. So, the corollary of this second uh, strong hypothesis of the importance of the anatomical connectivity of the visual word for Maria is that within the left ventral stream, the VWFA should be singled out 
by a preferential and potentially innate connectivity pattern to language areas. And more specifically for this work, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not getting used to the pointer. We had two uh, main predictions. The first one is that compared to the, adjac the adjacent left fusiform area, the VWFA should be more connected to language areas. And also, if you compare this area to, um, to other sections uh, along a posterior anterior axis, you should also see more connections to language. And we wanted to study this as a proof of concept uh, in support of, uh, of the, the role of connectivity in shaping the VWFA uh, in, in adults. So we use 75 right-handed literal adults. So the first part, uh, the first experiment that we did, we conducted uh, was uh, comparing the connections of uh, the VWFA and the FFA. What we did is define, um, define these regions functionally at the group level using simple functional localizers. And what we got are um, the red region for the VWFA and the blue region for the FFA uh, in blue. And these, uh, so that was more in, in the fusiform gyrus. And this area, uh, these two areas partly overlapped in the pink area that you saw. So we had three regions of interest. And we used these group level regions to define individual seeds uh, for tractography uh, by selecting only the most superficial white matter voxels of, uh, within these regions. And from them, we conducted uh, tractography and the tractograms were maps onto volumes, binaries, normalites, etc. And then we had these connectivity maps for each subject, for each of the ROIs, and we compared them. So when you look on average at the connectivity of the visual word from area, the red only region, and of the FFA, the blue only region, what you see is this. Is this. Uh, and what you can say is that the connections of the VWFA and the FFA roughly span the same area. However, when you conduct um, statistical uh, tests using permutation tests, what you uh, can see is that if you compare uh, the FFA to the other two regions, um, the, the FFA is more connected to mesial visual and limbic structures, while the uh, VWFA compared to the other regions rather um, set connections to um, a lateral uh, view of the left hemisphere and uh, mainly uh, perisylvian areas related to uh, language, for instance, Broca's area, the insula, the superior and lateral temporal cortices, etc. So, uh, next we were interested in seeing whether along the OTS, the occipital temporal circus, we could see uh, different differential connections to the language areas. And this was also further motivated by the fact that reading not only activates the VWFA, but also in a less specific manner, a larger occipitotemporal area that we refer to as the visual word from system, no longer the area, but the system. And the system is also thought to more generally detect in its more posterior parts lines and uh, their associations into letters and then uh, letter recognition of letters invariant of other uh, uh, visual contingencies, and then there are combinations in biograms, etc., um, until you reach a whole word representation. And here we had two questions. The first one is, is the VWFA the part of the visual word from system that is the most connected to language areas? And also, along the OTS, do different sections show distinct connectivity patterns to phonological and lexical regions. Indeed, for access to the pronunciation of the word, you need to have a sort of letter-by-letter -letter reading, which uh, is not the same as access to meaning that requires a whole word representation that occurs more interiorly in, in the visual word from system. Okay, so what we did is that we define this larger visual word from system with a, a more lenient 
threshold and we segmented it along the y-axis into seven parts. And then we used um, these regions exactly as, from, as in the previous experiment. We did tractography, et cetera, and we compared the connections of these regions. So this is the results of uh, the pseudo uh, ANOVA that we conducted, the YAF test, and what you can see is basically they differ everywhere. Um, if, you <laughs> go on, if you want to go more into details, you can um, see where each of the re these regions connect preferentially uh, compared to the others. So uh, here, for instance, what you see is, uh, are, are the areas that are statistically significantly more connected to the most posterior region, number one in red over there, and so on for all the seven regions. And what we could see, sorry again, <laughs> is that the three most posterior regions of this visual work from system were rather connected to early visual occipital and orbital frontal regions, whereas as you move forward along the OTS, you could see um, and from, from uh, row number five on, which is the start of the real core visual world from area, you could see emerge these connections to language related areas. And what was also interesting is that only the row number five, so the most posterior within the visual world from area connected to posterior MTG, which is implicated in graphene to phony mapping, while only rows number six and seven were connected to the anterior inferior temporal lobe, which, uh, which is implicated in the semantic axis. So in short, experiment one showed that the VWFA is significantly more connected to language-related areas uh, compared to the adjacent fusiform face area. We could also see in experiment number two that along the OTS, the most specific VWFA site is also the most connected to language areas and that within this area, we could see gradual connections to the phonological and semantic reading routes. So this, this um, suggests that indeed a connectivity could play a major role uh, in shaping the functional uh, specialization of the VWFA. And if you add on top of it, the results in the blind that show that visual biases are really not enough to explain the specialization of this area, we really support this second hypothesis of the importance of its anatomical connections. Uh, still, uh, in the study, we're studying adults. So to really confirm this hypothesis, um, a longitudinal study of pre-reading children would uh, uh, be required to confirm the causal role of connectivity here. Thank you very much. Okay, we have two, two questions, one here and one in the back. Thank you. This was very nice. Um, I wanted to ask with respect to the first study, uh, you said you localized the seed based on the group analysis and I think you might be missing out uh, because there is big variability in the functional, um, in the function, in a, the, actually the anatomical localization of these specific areas. So I wonder why not follow up with more subject specific ROIs that would probably uh, lower the overlap between these regions that well, you now you're sampling both uh, of these together. And um, about the second analysis that you've shown with the functional connectivity, you basically went along the y-axis. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that the actual cortical sheet is really um, a, a, a split according to this axis. So I'm wondering why you haven't actually selected it based on some functional localization such as a searchlight approach to functional connectivity seeds and went just by, I mean, why not just go on the Z or on the X? Uh, it, okay. That's... Okay, so for your first part of your question, of course, uh, 
individual variability in the visual word from area is really important and we indeed think that because anatomical connectivity is so important then uh, the, the variability in the location of the VWFA should, um, should be partly explained by the difference in connectivity. But um, so there are, uh, actually that's what we wanted to do at the beginning, uh, but it raises several problems. Um, the first one is that um, in the data set that we used, that was a previously acquired database, we didn't have um, we didn't have uh, strong visual controls for words, um, and um, and we had very few trials, which made um, the individual identification of the visual word from area really tricky. Uh, so when we tried to define um, this area on the basis of reliable activations, it w we were losing like a third of the participants or something like this. Um, it would give you a lot of things and then, then you don't really know if the pick you're fishing is, is really word specific and um, um, and uh, and also a problem in using individual seeds is like you're going then you're going to so we were also concerned that using different seeds uh, we there the connections um, then we could it could be it could be argued that if you start with different seeds across all subjects then you you may lose uh, in uh, in uh, statistical uh, strength and also. Uh, uh, if you really use functional uh, seeds uh, at the beginning, then you should also look at the overlap because we also know that in language areas, in the targets of these connections, there is a lot of variability. So, um, so this is actually something that I might want to explore later to really go into this variability. But with this data set, it was a bit tricky. Okay, I think we have, we have one short question in the back that I promised and then... I can, I can answer to the other questions right. later. <laughs> um, have you examined connectivity between the medial uh, wall of the occipital pole, so the calcarin sulcus, and also how, how should one wrap one's head around the fact that the fusiform face area isn't connected to language regions when speech and communication signals are to be expected to be connected to one another? No? Um, well, I'm not saying that they're not. You can obviously see that even when you look at the connections of the FFA, they sort of go toward, towards these regions as well, just a little bit less. And this, this little difference might be enough to shape the... Yeah. So you might, you might tone down then the dichotomy you're, you're painting. I'm sorry, I didn't get it. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> okay. But what about the... Have you looked at calcarin connections to... Uh, auditory cortices. So V1, I think, A1 I think we have to move, uh, I think we have to move on to the okay. next talk. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Daniel Kaiser. Okay, cool. Um, hi everyone, I'm Daniel. Um, I'm doing my PhD at the moment with Marius, which um, obviously, as we all know, has nothing to do with the award selection here because it's been done completely blindly, as uh, has been confirmed again now. Um, and I'm going to present to you a uh, fMRI study we've run on 
um, the topic of how visual cortex representations are um, modulated by attention. And uh, the way we did this was we used ambiguous figures or ambiguous stimuli such as these, we use different ones, but this is just to illustrate it. Like these are two ambiguous stimuli that have been widely researched, the NECA cube and the face vase illu illusion. And what people often did with these stimuli is they showed them for a longer time period and they tracked the reversals that people have. Sometimes you see the cube pointing towards you, sometimes you see it pointing away from you. What you can also do is like you present them for a short amount of time and you ask people, did you see the, did you see the vase? Did you see the faces? And then you get different responses depending on percept of the people that they have at that moment. One, one thing that is interesting about that is how does the brain deal with this, right? If I see the faces, if I see the ways, I have the same physical stimulus, but you see it differently, you perceive it differently, and the question is where in the brain is the correlate of this? Um, I don't want to go into too much detail because it's really straightforward findings. If you see the faces, you get a higher activity in face selective regions of the visual cortex. That could be one basic finding. So these category selective regions, they follow the thing that you perceive, at least if it's competition between objects in this case. However, what you would also notice with these stimuli is, of course, you can track the reversals of people, and sometimes you see one, sometimes you see the other. But if I ask you now, see the faces or see the ways, you can do it, right? Like you can use your attention to just see one or the other. At least to some extent, for most of these stimuli, you can do that. And that's what we were interested in here. We manipulated attention in a way that we explicitly told people, see one thing or see the other thing. Plus, we use stimuli that are a bit nicer, so uh, no words here, but we use these uh, uh, human hands with animal faces painted onto them. So what you could predominantly uh, focus your attention on is, of course, the shape of the hand now, or you could try to see the uh, animal face and sort of ignore the hand. Okay? So why would we use these, and why wouldn't we use like the face base illusion? Well, first of all, people like to look at these, and they look nice. Um, but apart from that, they are also good because they are more photorealistic. You don't come up with a weird condition that causes the ambiguity, but these are just like, you could do that if you were a good painter, you could take the picture and you have your ambiguous stimulus. The other advantage of this is that it's two clearly separate categories. It's not like the face wage illusion where you have like a selective region for faces and then you have something else, but here you have two regions, right? You have a region for hands, we have a region for faces, of which we know that it also responds to animal faces. So here we can sort of aim for like a double dissociation type of thing with enhancement and suppression maybe. Okay, so what we did here is we explicitly told people, okay, try to see the hand or try to see the animal. We didn't give them any like, specific instruction. We just told them, just try to do whatever you like to sort of focus on one of the two percepts. We did this in the simplest possible block design. So we just had a written instruction, focus on the hands, focus on the animals. We gave them a little reminder throughout the block, making the fixation cross an H or an A. And then into two blocks, stimuli were of course completely identical. Um, and from time to time, we threw in a piece of vegetable to keep people uh, busy, and then they had to press the button, OK? So super simple experiment, two conditions. Um, what we can take a look at first, and what, was the, what is the easiest expectation is, OK, if people do the hand task, you get a higher activation in hand selective regions if they do the face task, or the animal task here, you should get a higher activation in face selective regions. Um, so these are the, uh, the results of a simple GLM analysis here. I will just quickly talk you through this plot. So this is the. Uh, uh, bold activation estimate. Here on the um, x-axis, we have a criterion to select the voxels that we're looking at, which is um, we took all the voxels in visual cortex that are generally responsive for either hands or faces. And then within this region, we um, took voxels that are preferring one category over the other. Okay? So for example, the, time, the point 5 here would mean these are the five voxels that are preferring hands, uh, faces in this case, over hands the most while still being face selective above, above chance, okay? Um, so what you can see then in terms of the results is these are face preferring voxels. So as you expect, you get a higher activation in the attend animal condition than in the attend face condition. You can see it levels off a bit, both in the total magnitude, also in terms of the effect, if you take more voxels. So the effect is stronger or like tends to be stronger if you just pick more selective voxels. If you look at the hand preferring voxels, you get the uh, inverse pattern as we would expect. If you do the hand task, you get a higher activation in the hand preferring voxels than if you do the animal task. Okay? So here you can see the interaction. So this is uh, a difference score. So positive values means um, preference for the hand task over the face task. So higher response in the hand task, which is either the hand preferring voxels opposite for the face preferring voxels. 
Okay? So this is basically what we would have already expected. Now the problem with these net response differences is that we don't quite know where they come from, right? Could be related to the task, could be related to many different things. So we thought we could come up with a better measure, which, which is if, if I show you this ambiguous stimulus, maybe in your visual cortex you have like a pattern that is kind of a weird mixture between like hand, face, we don't really know what's going on. However, if I now tell you, try to focus on the hand, the whole pattern of um, activation or the representational pattern should get shifted towards a pattern that is typical for a hand. If I tell you, focus on the animal, the whole pattern should be shifted towards a typical face pattern. Okay, does that make sense? So how can we take a look at that? We can um, sort of come up with typical hand and face patterns from our simple uh, functional localizer. So we have grayscale human hands, we have grayscale human faces, um, and we use simple linear classification and we train a classifier. This is a schematic of, say, a response pattern. We train a classifier to discriminate the two in our localizer scans. And then afterwards, this classifier who has been trained on these benchmark patterns is now tested on the main experiment, where the stimulus is the same in both cases, but only the attention instruction is, is varying. Okay? And what we would expect is, this stimulus here, if I tell you, attend to the hand, should be more similar in its representation to an actual hand. And thus the classifier should <coughs> perform above chance if there is this like warping of the representation towards the attending categories going on in the region. Okay, so we did this in a, in a searchlight fashion. So we uh, moved the number of voxels around on all the brain, and then we looked for regions in which this is true. So for regions in which we find this attentional warping that is yeah, caused by this attentional focus that people have. And unsurprisingly, we find a region in visual cortex here. That's what we would have expected, right? Like visual cortex voxels, they shift their um, typical representation towards the attending category. Then we find two other regions, one in the inferior parietal lobe and one in the dorsal anterior cingulate that also show the same pattern. So first conclusion of this could be, okay, there are regions that show this attentional warping, which is what we would have expected. However, we don't quite know what these regions here do, right? Like, I mean, why would they come out of the analysis and what does it mean that we find them here? So um, what we did next, like to explore this effect of what, what these regions actually mean, uh, we conducted a uh, functional connectivity analysis between these regions and what I'm going to talk about is the functional connectivity between visual cortex on one side and the anterior cingulate on the other side. I will not talk about the parietal region simply because um, it was not so interesting what we found. Okay, so this analysis is, is, is really simple. So um, we basically can take the same voxel, voxel selection that we had in the univariate results. So we take the N most hand or face preferring voxels from visual cortex. So this is one example participant. Um, and then we correlate the time courses for the visual cortex voxels and the ACC voxels in the two conditions. Once in the attend the hand condition, once in the attend the face condition. To see if there's differences in the connectivity patterns between the two attention conditions. Okay? When we did this, what we, um, this plot is kind of the same as what I showed you before here. Again, the voxel selection, how many voxels we pick from visual cortex. Here's the um, uh, correlation of the time courses, which is a measure of the connectivity. Um, what you can see here is the face preferring voxels and uh, what you find, which is maybe at the beginning a bit counterintuitive, is that you have a higher uh, connectivity between the face preferring voxels and the ACC region when people do the hand task. Okay? You only find this effect if you pick the most selective voxels of visual cortex. If you add more voxels and add more voxels that are, don't have a strong preference, the effect levels off. Which is interesting is that for the hand preferring voxels we find the opposite effect. Now here we have a stronger connectivity um, during the attend animal conditions than during the attend hand conditions. Okay, so again, connectivity is stronger if you attend uh, for the unattended uh, preferring voxels in visual cortex. If we take a look at the interaction again, this is a different score. Here the um, positive values mean stronger connections during the attend hand task, which are present for the face preferring voxels, and the opposite is true for the hand preferring voxels. So what does this mean? Um, well, first of all, um, that ACC comes out of this analysis is somewhat surprising, but also it, on, it has been implicated in functions that make kind of a bit of sense in this context. ACC has been related to reversals in rivalry. It has been related to the control of spatial attention in visual cortex. And most importantly, it has also been related to a network that is involved in the control of task sets, for example. Um, and here, like this could be one mechanism how you could control your attentional set, which is by suppressing the thing that you don't want to see. Okay? So this is, of course, not directly following from this data, but it's a very reasonable uh, interpretation, I would say. So you have a higher connectivity with the unattended 
category in this case with the unwanted perceptive you may and um, thus we would interpret this result as a inhibitory connection that sort of triggers the attentional focus or like helps us to maintain the attentional focus that we have in one task condition so to sum this up we have um, shown here that we find attentional modulation of category selective regions in the visual cortex with the stimuli that we used which was not very surprising because it's kind of a replication of what has been shown before in addition to that we found three clusters in the cortex that show this attention based warping of representations towards the category that is attended and most importantly we have shown that this region in, in the dorsal ACC is modulating um, what's going on in visual cortex by a presumably inhibitory connection that controls um, the percept that we want, uh, want to see in the end I want to mention that we came up with this study during a uh, Harvard summer school course of last year so I want also like to acknowledge all the students that were uh, involved in like designing this study and then of course I want to thank uh, Paul Downing and then Marius here who is a bit dark but he's still there um, and thanks to you for your attention so with your um, third uh, bullet point I lost track of whether or not you were um, correlating univariate responses with anterior cingulate with univariate responses um, in those other areas or whether you were actually correlating it with your multivariate effects no this is the uh, this is a correlation of univariate responses only like okay. we tried to uh, we tried to do this with um, decoding accuracies also but we didn't find anything there so this is only pure univariate time course correlations that we're doing okay and um and so maybe you already tried what I'm about to say, but the work on what a cingulate responds to um, uh, in uh, domains of conflict um, is that it um, responds in situations of kind of high entropy um, where there's a mismatch between things, yeah. which would suggest that the kind of difference between the signals that you're getting from these areas, again, in, in, in an informational sense, not in a univariate activation sense, but that difference in information would be a state of higher entropy in the posterior cortex, and that the singular would be responding to that as opposed to controlling anything. Um, I, did, you, did you look for that kind of entropy-like signal, a kind of a mismatch of the two patterns? Um, is that it, when no, you I, said? I mean, yeah, we'd have to think about what the analysis would look like. We haven't done that yet. Like that wasn't the multivariate that work that you did. No. Okay. Can we have one more? You and did you have question? No. Any other question? Okay. Thank Good. Next, we have Ella Srimamit. Better now? Oh my God. Um, okay, I'm Ella. I'm now working with uh, Alfonso, and the work that I'm presenting now is uh, work that I started in my PhD with uh, Miramedi and also mentored by Alfonso. So, I'm going to be talking about functional connectivity of the visual cortex with regard to written topical principles. And this was, oh well. And um, I don't need to tell anyone in this audience that the visual cortex has retained task selectivity in the blind. Um, just finding all the figures from everyone in the audience uh, took a lot of space, as you can see. And after Sami's talk, I think we all know that. Uh, we also know that there is uh, retained functional network connectivity so, for example, the, the EBA is better connected to uh, body image areas, the VWFA is more connected to language areas, and when you can uh, sort of compare the connectivity patterns, you see that these uh, connectivity patterns st stand out quite nicely. Uh, what isn't quite clear yet is, um, oh, sorry. So, basically, the associative visual cortex is very robustly showing task and category selectivity regardless of the sensory modality so it's been shown in touch and audition and sensory substitution regardless of the visual experience uh, regardless of learning a new modality uh, sort of uh, information in the cases of sensory substitution and even in categories that were not 
uh, very much expertise by the blind, for example, body shapes. Um, but what is not completely known quite yet is what is going on in the early visual cortex. Um, and again, following Marina's talk and other works from people in the audience, I don't need to tell you either that the early visual cortex doesn't sit around waiting for vision to occur. And it's activated for a variety of tasks and modalities, ranging from every modality you can think of uh, through um, memory, language, etc. Um, and the question we wanted to ask is there retained organization there as well? Uh, so, um, what we did was to try to target the large-scale organization of the visual cortex in terms of retinotopic mapping. Um, and since I'm presenting most of my figures on these horrible uh, unfolded cortical maps, I'll just remind you that uh, when you inflate the cortex and you kind of, mm, that I should be able to do this, okay, and when you slice it across um, the calcarine sulcus, you get this um, weird uh, representation of the visual cortex. Um, so what we did was um, take uh, seeds within V1, um, which we um, acquired uh, through a, a, an external visual localizer in a group of sighted people. We divided V1 to its uh, central and peripher peripheral aspects, its right and left, and its top and bottom halves. And we used these regions in a partial connectivity analysis in resting state data in the blind. Um, what you see above here is the um, result uh, we get in the sighted people, just to verify that this method is working. Uh, you can see here the um, functional connectivity from the fovea in V1, which extends in the middle, and from the periphery on both sides in both hemispheres. You can see uh, not so clear right and left division and a top bottom division as well. And the nice thing about it is that this is exactly what you get also in the congenitally blind subjects. So again, fovea periphery, uh, left and right, and top and bottom. Um, this type of organization was very robustly present in, uh, the, across the blind participants. What you see here is the overlap probability across the blind subjects. Um, I could also show you the single subject maps, but that's a lot of data. Um, and importantly, the variation between the different uh, blind subjects was not so different from that in the sighted. So when we gave uh, K-clustering uh, analysis, uh, the maps of the blind and of the sighted, it couldn't tell apart which map was whose. Okay, so it first took out one sighted subject and then another, and apparently it looks like the variation between the sighted individuals is greater than that between the groups. So, Generally, uh, these results demonstrate that developing retinotopical network architecture, and that's again just functional connectivity, does not require visual experience. Next, we wanted to see how far does this, uh, connect this connectivity pattern extend. Um, it has been previously shown that uh, the retinotopic biases in visual cortex of normally sighted people extend all the way to uh, object-related areas, such that the border between preference for uh, fovea versus prefer for preference for periphery uh, stands right between the face and the uh, uh, scene areas. Um, so what we did here was use, again, externally localized ROIs of the FFA and the PPA to test for the uh, functional connectivity with uh, different aspects of V1. And what you can see here is that, again, also in the blind, um, FFA on both sides show pre shows preference uh, for uh, foveal, uh, or in this case central, uh, connectivity to in V1, and PPA does the opposite, so preference uh, for uh, peripheral V1 connectivity. Um, interestingly, again, the ANOVA did show a highly significant region and eccentricity effect interaction, but again, no group effect. So, Again, the, that look, it looks like these patterns are the same between the blind and the sighted. Um, now, these types of maps could arise from two different sources. The first is that um, within, within um, while the, the fetuses are developing in utero, there are spontaneous ways of activity throughout the eye, and that can propagate across uh, the visual tracts to the visual cortex and create these to sort of topographical representations. Um, the other one is, of course, the uh, genetically hardwired uh, um, organizations. And what we wanted to see, and we were lucky that we were able to do that, is if um, 
the spontaneous activity is, ne is necessary to get this type of organization. And we were lucky to have a small group, a subgroup, of uh, blind people that were blinded due to microphthalmy, so that their eyes did not develop properly um, in utero as well. So they had never had a functioning um, retina. And even in these subjects, we can see the exact same pattern. So again, this is just four subjects. It has to be replicated in a larger group, and also preferably with people who are completely anophthalmic. Uh, but it also suggests that um, even the genetic biases are in the genetic uh, patterning are enough to create this type of organization. Now, this does not go to say that there are no differences between the blind and the sighted in functional connectivity, as was previously shown multiple times before. When you take the entire seed of V1 in the blind and compare that to the functional connectivity in the sighted, you get the regular uh, decrease in functional connectivity to the uh, auditory and somatosensory cortices, an increase in functional connectivity to several regions in the parietal lobe and in, and in the uh, frontal lobe, and that uh, is not different in our data set. Uh, what we wanted to test is if there is a difference uh, between the connectivity patterns of the different aspects of V1. So what you can see here, and I know it's, it's a bit cluttered, is uh, the functional connectivity differences in, between the groups, um, be, uh, <laughs> between the groups, between the seeds of, uh, in the seeds of the center and the seeds of the periphery. And what you can see right, o hey. what you can see right over here is uh, that the central aspect of V1 in the blind is preferably um, connected to uh, Inferior frontal, gy inferior frontal gyrus and sulcus um, in the left hemisphere, and the periphery is more connected to more, um, I don't know, con executive control, spatial attention networks uh, in the blind. So even the plasticity patterns, even the types of most robust changes that you can get in blindness that are related to language and that are in connectivity to V1 are also divided according to retinotopic divisions. Um, lastly, we wanted to see if this type of organization retention uh, is uh, unique to um, the visual cortex. And in an ongoing work with George Almeida and Yan Chaobi and her students, and of course, Alfonso Kamata, uh, we're now looking into the organization of the deaf auditory cortex using functional connectivity. Um, so what you see right over here is uh, the high frequency, low frequency, high frequency organization of the auditory cortex. Um, this is still just auditory tones activating the auditory cortex of normally hearing, hearing subjects. And, okay, I will not be using this. And here you can see that the same type of pattern can emerge from functional connectivity in hearing subjects and in deaf subjects. So uh, there are preliminary evidence that this type of retention of organization can also be seen in the auditory cortex of the deaf. What does it all mean? Okay, so I'll start with the consensus and move forward. The visual cortex of the blind is flexible. Some of the visual properties develop without visual experience, and now we can say that also for retinotopic organization, functional connectivity. Uh, again, just functional connectivity. But the fact that this pattern develops without visual experience is retained throughout life without visual experience when there are such imp uh, important and robust cross-model plasticity effects going on is still, um, well, we find it interesting. Um, and this could be due to the hardwired genetic determined processes, which as, as far as uh, functional meaning uh, goes, it could go really either way. It could have some cross-model significance in the blind re regarding spatiotopic organization. There are some evidence for that with uh, echolocation experts and um, some um, relatively unique cases that you see. It still has to be investigated more. It could be, it could exist there, not interfere with cross-model plasticity, and not, um, and not have significance, which I slightly doubt. And it could also interfere with plasticity. The, the question that really remains is, does it have any bearings on functional sight or addition restoration? Because um, in, in auditory restoration, at least, it is quite known that uh, the level of cross-model organization prior to cochlear implantation has an effect on the auditory um, um, 
there's a word for that, um, on the auditory um, abilities post cochlear implantation. Um, there is also so, uh, some evidence, recent evidence, that the level of cross model organization in blind people who have restored their sight is also decreasing following sight restoration. And now the question remains, if this type of organization that is existing prior to, um, prior to sight restoration uh, can be shown to correlate uh, with the effect afterwards. And, and with this, uh, if anyone has relevant patients, let me know, please. Um, I'd like to thank um, Amir Amedi and uh, Alfonso Karamatza, my collaborators in Germany, Arno Willinger and Daniel Mangolis. Uh, for the new work, I'm working with George Almeida, Almeida uh, Jan Chaubi and her students. And thank you all for your attention. Okay, we have uh, one, one question in the back and one question here and then I'm sorry, Olivier. Hey, thanks for a great talk. That's an exquisite body of, um, of evidence. I was just wondering, could you please repeat, how do you reconcile um, the, the cortex of blind being flexible and then this, uh, the specialization occurring without experience? Because for me, this, this is... What? Sorry, can you repeat that? How can you reconcile uh, the argument that you're making that the, co um, the cortex of the blind is flexible mm -hmm. and then with this uh, specialization occurring without experience? For me, that's... Um, well, contradictory. This is what we show here is exactly this type of balance. Um, well, here is exactly this type of balance. So there is some retained organization, but there are also some some uh, strange differences due to cross modal plasticity, due to other invading functions. Um, my data set just shows this. I will uh, not claim to have all the answers at this point. I'm afraid. Thanks. Um, I'm especially struck by the overlap and similarities between the blind and the sighted in all of these different uh, demonstrations that you've, you've shown us. And I'm particularly struck by it because of um, the existing literature that, for example, blind individuals show some auditory responses in visual cortex, deaf individuals show visual responses, I mean, whatever, you know, the complementarity. Helen Neville's work, Daphne Bavillier's work, etc. It's surprising to me that this kind of, as you refer to perhaps cross-modal plasticity, does not impact the organization of cortex. I don't think it does not impact the organization. This type of analysis is very unique in the sense that we've regressed out the shared variance between the two seeds of the visual cortex. So when you take the entire visual cortex, the entire V1, you can see that there are differences, okay? Um, but when you uh, compare directly the functional connectivity of the periphery and of the center, that is the pattern that you get. Mm -hmm. um, what I would like to do, and I haven't done yet, is compare the strength of the connectivity patterns between the cross-model changes and the, the uh, division between the areas. Um, sorry, now we had one question before that I had to, <laughs> we actually do have uh, time for, for Olivier's question that, he, sorry, he was. So more an extension of the previous question. Um, so how do you reconcile the fact that, um, obviously you will agree that um, the recruitment of the visual cortex in the blind is functionally specific, right? And you have a decrease in functional connectivity between auditory and functional re and, or occipital region, right? Mm -hmm. And after that, you use resting state functional connectivity to infer functional relevance. I don't infer functional relevance. That, that is exactly why I finished with a question, what does it all mean? And uh, stating specifically that I don't know the functional relevance of these uh, retained organizations. Uh, for the early visual cortex, it's uh, the balance between plasticity and retained organization is very, is very unclear, uh, as you know quite well yourself. Uh, we know for the uh, associative visual cortex that the, the retained function and retained organization are very robust 
and that when you compare different tasks and different modalities, what you come up with is that the task that was supposed to be done visually by the area is the task that is done, is, is most prominent uh, through audition or touch in the blind in the same region. What goes on in the early visual cortex? I don't you, think anyone knows quite yet. I don't think you can escape, right? Um, <laughs> I'm not trying to escape. I'm trying to raise more, da more data and more findings to try and attack the problem. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so I'll present you today about action okay. perception, okay? And action perception in the everyday life is just everywhere. We are continuously seeing people moving their bodies, moving their feet, moving their hands, interacting with objects, and we are extremely good at perceiving these movements, predicting them, anticipating them, interpreting them. We can interact with people synchronously, we can almost immediately understand what people are doing, and we can infer a lot of information, such as information about their mental states or about the most likely outcome of their actions from their kinematics. We can, for instance, see that someone is working happily or working sadly, for instance. And in this study, we try to understand whether these abilities rely on a process of motor simulation. Okay? These questions might be surprising to some of you. And this is because we all know that traditionally, action perception is not a function of the motor system. Action perception is assumed to rely on computations occurring in a perceptual system, a conceptual system, an inferential system, and so on. But the most important point is that, despite the motor system can be activated by different mechanisms for different reasons, such as for uh, observational motor learning, for instance, it does not contribute to perception, okay? However, this view has been challenged by a whole series of motor simulation theories of action perception, which, despite their very numerous differences, all assume that very efficient perception of movement requires a process of unconscious covert imitation of the observed movement, which is called motor simulation. And by that way, by motorically simulating the observed movement, the observer is able to retrieve knowledge he has about these movements and actions when he himself executes them, such as, whoa, what are the body biomechanical constraints that influence the execution of this movement? Or what's my goal when I myself execute these movements and so on? And in this study, we tested this hypothesis. To do so, what we did was quite straightforward. We just tested the ability to perceive and understand upper limb actions in, in, in individuals who are born without upper limbs or I would say very short-term upper limbs. So the logic is the following. Because these individuals have no upper limb motor representations or no motor representations of upper limb movement that they can use to motorically simulate upper limb actions, then the expectation of the motor simulation theories is that their performance should somewhat differ from the performance of controlled participants in at least the tasks that assess action perception uh, aspects of action perception that really require a motor simulation. And this is the prediction that we tested across a range of experiments. In the very first experiment, we uh, asked whether we need a motor simulation simply to be able to understand very efficiently observed actions. To uh, answer this question, we simply asked our participants to view video clips of an actress pantomiming a polym action, such as combing oneself or playing the violin. And we asked our participants to name each of these actions 14 different times in a gradual unmasking paradigm, where the video clips were first shown for only 330 milliseconds, and then uh, the videos had, had an increasing duration by steps of 165 milliseconds until more than 2.5 seconds. And for each participant that you can see here on the x-axis with the dysplasics in red, 
the controls in gray and the mean of the control participants in green, we have simply calculated the mean number of steps of demasking that they needed to identify an action. And as you can see here, it's very clear that the dysplasics do not need more steps of demasking to identify an action. They are not less efficient than the control participants. And from these results, we conclude that no, it does not. We do not need motor simulation to be efficient to recognize an action. However, it might be that motor simulation might be particularly important when it comes to recognize actions perceived in very difficult perceptual conditions. To test this hypothesis, we showed our participants video clips showing an actor reduced to only 12 light dots originally attached to his main joints. And we, once again, presented them with 20 of such video clips and we asked them to name them, to recognize the actions. For each participant, here again shown on the x-axis with the same color code, we simply calculated the percentage of correct responses. And as you can see on the right, two of the dysplastic people, despite they are completely unable to motorically simulate this movement, were just among the best participants. So I think we can conclude that no, it does not. We do not need motor simulation to be able to recognize these actions, even under very difficult perceptual conditions. Another possibility is that we need motor simulation not to recognize actions, but to learn to recognize actions. Okay, let's test that. To test that, we ask our participants to memorize 21 video clips of an actress performing meaningless gestures with her upper limbs. Like that, or like that. Then we ask them to recognize these 21 video clips among 21 other video clips showing very similar movements. The performance of the participants, once again on the x-axis, and simply, simply the sensitivity uh, deep prime index on the y-axis. And as you can see, it's very clear that, once again, the performance of the dysplastic participants did not differ from the performance of the control participants. So it looks like, no, we do not need motor simulation to be very efficient at learning to recognize new actions. Yet, another hypothesis is that we might need motor simulation, in particular when it comes to be able to make uh, inferences based on the very fine-grained analysis of someone else's movement. This was a very interesting, uh, I think, hypothesis, and we used two experiments to test it. In the first experiment, participants viewed video clips of an actor throwing a basketball. The video clip was interrupted at the time the ball leaves the hand of the actor, and we asked our participants to use the available kinematic information to predict the outcome of the shot. In a second experiment, our participants were viewing video clips of an actor lifting a large box, or just of the hand of the actor lifting a small box. And in 50% of these video clips, the actor was in fact uh, misinformed about the real weight of the box. So they were told, for instance, please go lift the box, it's 18 kilos. And actually the box was only 15 kilos. So they have a kind of uh, postural readjustment during their lifting phase. And we asked our participants, please look carefully at these video clips and try to uh, detect from the kinematic of the lifting phase whether the actor has been or not deceived about the weight of the box. Once again, for all the participants, we took the deep prime sensitivity index. And once again, the performance did not differ from the performance of the control participants. This is the result you can see here for the basketball free shot uh, task with one of the dysplastic being even in the four best participants. This is also what you can see here in the two conditions of the uh, deception detection task, let's say. So it looks like, no, we don't need motor simulation to account for this ability. But still, motor simulation might be particularly important when it comes to explain very basic aspects of perception, such as, for instance, our tendency to systematically perceive the position of a moving body part slightly ahead of its real position, which is called a perceptual anticipation bias, or to account for how this bias is modulated by implicit knowledge we have about the body biomechanics. To test this hypothesis, we used a task in which we know that participants' performance can reveal these two perceptual biases. I have a lot to say about this task, but it's actually quite simple. Participants were seeing two kinds of series of three pictures. One series is this, is this one, tack, 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 inducing the perception of a movement that would be very difficult to continue along the same trajectory or tac, tac, tac. Perception of a movement that would be very easy to continue along the same trajectory. Very importantly, these two series end with the same, very same uh, target last picture. 
So each time, in both conditions, the last picture is the following, showing always the hand in the same position. And then participants see a last picture, a probe, and their task is to decide whether the probe showed the hand at the very same position as the, hand, as the position of the hand on the target frame. Okay? There are different kind of probes. Obviously, one of these probes is the same as the target. So they have to say, oh yes, the hand is at the very same position as it was at the end of the inducing stimuli. This is the exact same. Two of the probes are false. And these two false show the hand slightly displaced away from the body. Okay? Because they are displaced, because the hand is displaced away from the body, it will be called up, up, a backward probe in the easy condition. Why? Because in the easy condition, the hand moves this way, and then if the hand position on the probe is there, the position is shifted backward along the hand trajectory. But it will be called a forward probe in the awkward condition. Because in the awkward condition, the hand stops here, and if the hand is displaced away from the body, it is displaced forward along the trajectory of the hand. The two other probes showed the hand displaced toward the body. So for the same reasons, these probes will be called forward probes in the easy condition and backward probes in the awkward condition. I really hope you follow me. Okay, that's perfect. And expected, what are the expected results in this task? In this task, typically in the easy condition, so when people are seeing the hand moving this way, they tend to see the position of the hand shifted a bit forward along its trajectory. So they respond more often the same. Oh, this is the same. When the hand is moved forward, than when the hand is moved backward. So for forward than for back, backward probes. But this effect is constrained by knowledge we have about how the body can move. So when they see the hand moving like that, they know that the hand is really unlikely to go further away. So this bias disappears is significantly uh, smaller. So to understand whether these two biases rely on motor simulation, we just use this task with the people born without the problem. And as you can see here, each of these individuals had the very same two biases. They all had a significantly larger number of same responses for forward than for backward probes in the easy condition. And this bias was in all participants significantly smaller for the, in the awkward condition. And actually we replicated this finding in two further experiments using continuous motion, different kind of movements, and more controlled stimuli. So I feel pretty confident in saying that now we don't need motor simulation, actually, to account for these two perceptual biases. So you will not be surprised by my conclusion, which is that efficient perception, anticipation, prediction, learning, comprehension of actions do not seem to require motor simulation. OK, I would like to thank all these people who contributed in some ways to uh, these experiments. I couldn't see the, the temporal order, so we, maybe we have these four. I could see four, we have four questions of uh, one and a half minutes each. Then maybe uh, we start clockwise. Then, from my perspective. So this was so interesting. Thank you. I noticed that in um, many of the tasks, the the persistence with aplasia actually performed better than your controls, and I'm wondering if you think that might have to do with their their visual experience and they're performing these visual tasks based on that visual experience and likewise whether if you did some sort of stimulation of visual cortex whether they perform you know like TMS or something to interfere yeah. with the processing whether they would perform more poorly. Mm. This is an extremely interesting question but I will have to uh, disappoint you because actually we have no differences between the dysplastic and the control so I think it's not correct to say that in some tasks the dysplastics perform better I think it's more correct to say that they perform just like everybody else. When we use group statistics instead of individual participant statistics, the mean are always extremely similar, the variants are extremely similar, perceptual biases are extremely similar. So I just think it's more correct to say they are the same. Do you have a prediction about the visual, about visual stimulation, whether they might be using another modality? So, so I think. One other way to conclude this study would be, oh, maybe everybody needs motor simulation except the dysplastics. Maybe they have a different strategy, as you yeah. say. But I think uh, if this is the case, we have to assume that they have developed alternative strategies, and we have no idea what they could be, that could explain in all these different tasks, testing all these different aspects of perception, that they have the same speed, same accuracy, same perceptual biases. We would also have to explain why the controls cannot and do not develop these strategies 
and we would have to assume that motor simulation plays a role in our brains. And I have no evidence supporting any of these possibilities. So I think it's just more safe to assume that this conclusion can be generalized to everybody. Okay, I think uh, Gary first, uh, in the middle there. Then we have Marlene and... So I don't want to be a defender of motor simulation, but everything that we've learned so far today about today and yesterday about uh, blind individuals is that they recruit the same areas in largely similar ways as sighted individuals. So what I'd be convinced by is if you were to show that um, were you to put people in a scanner who are either these participants or others, and the, the others who have all limbs fire up, you know, premotor cortex and motor cortex, and these guys don't. It's yeah. very, very likely these guys are recruiting exactly the same neural substrates that are controlling, after all, the rest of their body mm -hmm. and are using those. So I'm not entirely sure that um, one can really rule that out because, after all, I don't actually have to do motor simulation to understand an event that I'm looking at, but I may nonetheless be recruiting those motoric areas. I can watch the Olympics. I can't do high jump. I mm -hmm. can't do synchronized swimming. But I watch it, and I'm great, but I bet my motor cortex is, mm -hmm. is firing up. Yes. I, I think this is a very interesting question in itself. Do these people, and will these people activate the same brain regions, same brain network, when they see these upper limb movements that they've never done, that they are not able to do? But in my mind, this question is quite independent uh, to the very functional question we were asking in this study, which is, do you or not need to be able to covertly perform the very same movements is the movement that you observe to be able to perceive and interpret actions. And I think this is legitimate, I see you said no, but I think this is legitimate to ask this question that way because this is the way this hypothesis is traced in one big part of the literature. Now we can go further, we can always go further and we are currently going in this direction, but uh, I'm pretty confident in saying that we don't need this functionally defined motor stimulation procedure to support action perception. So um, I think I have a similar kind of comment to, to other people uh, about whether these patients could be doing these tasks in different ways. But in addition, the question is whether these tasks, even in normals, need M1 or how much they rely on what you're calling motor simulation, which really could be relatively late. You know, so these patients, if I'm not mistaken, they have, they have, they're missing their hand rep and arm representation in M1, but presumably many other aspects of their motor planning processes earlier pro are still intact. And in fact, I think there's some work by Angela Sergu's group, I, I, I don't know if she's still here, but that show that motor imagery in these patients is normal in, in, um, in uh, amputees is normal in the face of abnormal later hand-specific M1 representation. So to use these as the test sample for abnorm abnormalities in uh, motor processing may not be, may not be a good case because they're intact in these very processes that are needed to do the tasks that you used. Well, I think there is one question which is, do we need to recruit some part of the motor system or some part of the brain, which is used to plan movements to support our ability to perceive action. And this is a very interesting question. I think it's like slightly different from the question we tried to answer in this study. So these results are limited to the way I phrase the prediction that we tested. And I, once again, I feel pretty confident that we can say that. I wouldn't say that, that from these results we can say that non-structures in the motor system can contribute to perception. It, it, it may well be, but... Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all I want to say about that. I have a very quick question. Um, and that is, you argue that there's no difference between the groups. But in fact, when you look at your distribution on a subject-by-subject -subject basis, it looks to me more than chance or coin flip that uh, some of your individuals fall in the lower range. And moreover, across these different tasks, sometimes it's like subject two and three, sometimes it's five and one. And so my question is, uh, is there something very subtle in your data that um, requires additional explanation? Nothing subtle that we have been able to find, at the least. Uh, I would say that for sure we have um, had a look at that 
and the output of the statistical analysis that we performed to know if the variance of the dysplastic participants in each task was different from the variance of the performance of the controls, but also whether the variance of the performance of each individual was different across tasks. For instance, one dysplastic could be the best and then the worst and so on. If these variances were different from the variances that we found in the control group, it was never the case, except in this task, which is the point light display naming task, in which we add a different variance in the dysplastics people and in the control people, with some of the dysplastics among the worst and two among the best participants. This is something we would like to try to explain, but we don't really have any evidence that speaks to that issues right now. So this is probably something that we will uh, continue to investigate further in the future. Okay, last question to you, Sharon. So if you go back to your conclusion slide. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and I, my, my comment slash question uh, is um, not entirely original among the comments you've just heard, but I appreciated that you didn't put a period at the end of this sentence um, because it suggests that there's a continuation, um, which is do not require a process of motor simulation in people who have never had limbs. Um, and I do think, you know, I, I take your point about parsimony, it's good when you, when you got it, um, but I, I do think that at least many sensory motor theories of conceptual representation, including action concepts, um, uh, contend that the way you learn about something affects what kind of simulation you do when you retrieve that information. Mm -hmm. And so given that they didn't learn about this through experience with their limbs, I don't think the prediction is that they would be affected. Now, you're right, the task for you or for you know, people in the room who disagree with you would be to find evidence that they're doing something differently than people who learned with limbs. But that doesn't mean it would be a difference in performance. So it might be that the similarity space of action representations has been changed mm -hmm. in a way, but I don't think it makes a performance difference. Um, so it would be good to complete that sentence um, and with the limitation of you really are describing this in people who learned without limbs. I would love to complete that sentence as well. Like saying, but you know, by the way, motor simulation is very useful or having had motor experience in performing an action is very useful for point, point, point. I just haven't been able to find any evidence for any function of this. But I think this idea of looking at for some neural evidence or some similarity evidence, you know, non-neural similarity evidence this would be a, a really good way to go. Probably something we should like look at in the future, in the future. Thank you. And great talk. Good. No, I just wanted to, to add a comment to Sharon's comment, uh, and that is, uh, um, as Sharon pointed out, uh, some of us believe that uh, one should have positive evidence for theoretical claims. Uh, and what uh, has been shown here is that if you use the tasks that have been claimed to require motor simulation to be performed, the answer is no, they do not require it. So if, if that's the case, so, no, so wait, so there are two conclusions. One, the one that Sharon pointed out, that is you complete that sentence, it is not required um, uh, by people who have no limbs. And furthermore, the evidence that has been cited in support of motor simulation cannot be cited as such, correct? because for the reasons that we've just shown. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks to all the winners.